Hi, Chris Potts here. Welcome to the second screencast for our unit on semantic composition. Part one reviewed the high level concepts and covered our notation for describing functions. Here, we're just gonna start directly with building our semantic grammar. The first major step in this is building the semantic lexicon, which is the place where almost all the complexity in the grammar lies. So in section three here, we introduce the basic semantic objects. These are our building blocks for all the lexical meanings that we'll develop. First, we have the two truth values, T for true and F for false. This is where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, uh, in terms of truth conditional semantics. We needn't imbue these objects with any special philosophical import right now. Just think of them as making distinctions that will help us construct a small possible world. Next comes what we call the universe. This is the set of entities that will inhabit our possible world. I do hope you recognize all these Simpsons characters. If not, don't worry, we'll give them names in a moment. I do want to say that I'm sorry to leave Marge out of our possible world. She's a compelling character who would add a lot to our story, but her famous hair is just too famously tall and it makes the handout totally unmanageable. So our only adult supervision will be Homer. As I said, these entities and truth values are the basis for our semantic grammar. Let's start using them to construct the semantic lexicon. The first step is one we've already discussed at length. Our proper names refer directly. So you've got proper names Maggie, Lisa, Bart, and Homer, uh, each one referring directly to an entity in our universe U. Next are the nouns. These two are familiar from our previous discussions. We're going to continue modeling nouns as sets of entities semantically. This is clearly very bare bones. It captures just the basic truth conditions and none of the rich conceptual knowledge that we use to determine in reality whether an entity is a member of a noun's denotation or not. But that's okay. We could in principle go back and fill in those conceptual details, perhaps by redefining these sets as functions with complex behavior, defining the true criteria for being a Simpson or a child or the like. I've given meanings here that are aligned with standard Simpsons lore, I would say. So everyone in the universe is a Simpson. So I could have just written you here. Uh, these are the children. Only Lisa and Bart are in school, and Homer is our lone parent. All right, intransitive verbs. We haven't discussed these before. Uh, like nouns, we say that these denote sets of entities. Again, that's very limited, but it will suffice for our purposes. Homer and Bart skateboard. Uh, Bart is the canonical skateboard, but Homer famously jumped Springfield Gorge on a skateboard, so I included him. Lisa is a great student, and Bart is not. Lisa and Maggie lead thoughtful, introspective lives, whereas Bart and Homer tend not to. And of course, Maggie doesn't say a word. To understand how these meanings will behave in complex constructions, it might help to get a glimpse of how intransitive verbs will combine with their subject meanings in our full semantic grammar. So intuitively, these verbs combine with a subject to produce a truth-valued claim, as in the sentence Bart skateboards. In terms of the semantics, that will be built up around a test for set membership. If the subject's denotation is a member of the verb's denotation, then the sentence is true, otherwise the sentence is false. Now on to transitive verbs. And transitive verbs are those that take a direct object, like teases and admires. These are more complex. These are the first meanings that we'll see that actually denote functions. Intuitively, you should think of a transitive verb as taking in the meaning of the direct object to produce an intransitive verb meaning. In more technical terms, a transitive verb takes the direct object meaning as its argument to produce a set of entities. So let's look at teases. It starts with lambda y, that's the open slot for the direct object meaning. When that comes in, we do a sort of lookup. So for example, if Homer is the incoming argument, then the return value is the set containing Bart and Lisa. That's the set of people who tease Homer. I have to emphasize that because it might feel backward at first. The first argument is the direct object. It comes in and then we get a set of entities. As with intransitive verbs, when we do get a subject, we'll test whether the subject meaning is a member of the set that the verb phrase denotes. So for example, Bart teases Homer will come out true in our model because Bart is in this set here whereas Maggie teases Homer will come out false because Maggie is not in this set here. As before, I've given meanings for these verbs that seem well aligned with standard Simpsons lore. Bart, Lisa, and Homer all tease each other, and Maggie neither teases nor is teased. Uh, for admires, everyone admires Lisa and Maggie, but no one admires themselves. 
and so forth. We could continue in this way. Again, the compositional insight here is that transitive verbs combine with their direct objects to become semantically intransitive sets of entities. Right here you see a simple breakdown of T's as Homer. We look up the meanings for the two parts, teases and Homer, and we apply the meaning of teases to Homer, and we get the set of entities that tease him. At this stage, you should be able to do the same sort of breakdown for admire Maggie. It will pay to do the individual steps like a computer would. You might see the answer already, like a flash of insight, but remember, don't get creative. Do as your computer would do for all of these calculations. Okay, on to adjectives. Here we step up the complexity even more in terms of using functions. Intuitively, our adjective meanings combine with noun meanings to produce new noun meanings. So we're thinking initially about basic structures of the sort we've seen before, like scholarly child. We're going to define the adjective scholarly as a function that takes in the meaning of child to produce something that is semantically also a noun meaning, that is a set of entities from our universe. Let's look, in fact, at the assigned meaning in 13. So this lambda x here is the open slot, and I've used capital letters for the variable to indicate that this function is not looking for an entity, but rather for a set of entities. When that set comes in, we do our substitution, and we simply do the intersection of the incoming set, whatever it is, with this set here, the set Maggie and Lisa. Intuitively, this set containing Maggie and Lisa is the set of scholarly entities in our possible world but it's crucial to take note that we do not define the meaning of scholarly as a set of entities. It's a function on sets, mapping them to new sets. This is an idea we saw before when we were discussing the partee typology. I drew them out with toy diagrams like this. This lambda function captures the same insight, but in more general terms. The adjectives distractible and hungry are the same way, and Springfieldian would be too. Here you'd prob probably define that in terms of the intersection with the entire universe, since everyone is a Simpson. For all these examples, we have a clear entailment for the noun, since we're intersecting the noun meaning with the set that defines the adjective meaning. Importantly, though, the same semantic type works for the non-intersective adjectives. For example, consider alleged in 17. There's no set of alleged things, at least not in a sense that's useful here, right? You could be an alleged spy and not an alleged linguist, right? The allegations are noun-specific. An alleged spy does not entail spy, as we've seen. So here's a sketch of how to capture that. The meaning of alleged takes in a set X, that is the noun meaning, and it returns the set of entities that someone claimed to be an X. No intersection and no assertion that the entity is in fact in the set. Final observations about adjectives for now. In 18, we see how to interpret scholarly child. We do the two lookups for the lexical meanings, and then we apply scholarly to child. And that reduces down to this set intersection here. And we could, of course, reduce this further to just the set containing Maggie and Lisa. Importantly, the result in 18 is a set, and that means that other adjectives can modify it. For example, in 19, we interpret hungry scholarly child, and this just involves applying the meaning of hungry from 15 to the set that we got in 18. So this will reduce down to just the set containing Maggie. That reveals some imprecision in my earlier formulation. Adjectives do combine with noun meanings to produce new noun meanings, but they can also do that with modified noun meanings. And this is how we can interpret an infinite number of trees in this way. The outputs and inputs match in terms of their semantic types, so we can just keep on modifying. The final meaning I want to cover in this screencast is negation. Uh, what we want is a negation that will operate directly on verb phrases, either in transitive verbs or transitive verbs that have combined with their objects. And you might pause here if you, and see if you can fill in the appropriate missing meaning. We want to take in, for example, the meaning of skateboards and have it produce all of the non-skateboarders from our universe. To do that, we just get the complement of the input set X the set of things in our universe that are not in the set X. And that's all we need for never skateboards and never admires Maggie. And if the syntax allows it, we could semantically allow negation to stack, right? Two negations would cancel each other out, three would be like one, and so forth. Okay, great. We've made an excellent start on our semantic lexicon. The next step in the process is to define meanings for quantificational determiners. 
Those are the most complex meanings we'll consider in this course, so they get their own dedicated screencast. After that, we'll have our entire lexicon, and we'll be able to define our full semantic grammar using it.